sing, but don't have love. I waste my breath with every song I bring. An empty voice, a hollow noise. If I speak with a silver tongue, convince a crowd, but don't have love. I leave a bitter taste with every word I say. So let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Let my love look like you and what you made. Jump and it jumps, but I don't love. I'm nothing. If I give all I own to the poor, or even go to the stake to be burned as a martyr, but I don't love, I've gone nowhere. So, no matter what I say, no matter what I believe, no matter what I do, I'm bankrupt without love. Let my life be the proof, the proof of your love. Love look like you and what you made of How you lived, how you died Love the sacrifice So let my life be the proof The proof of your Baptist Church. It's great to be able to have everybody here today. It's great to be able to celebrate all the things that God is doing in our lives, all that God is doing in our congregation here, and all that God is doing in our community. You know, we sometimes don't look to what God is doing in different places, but God is always at work. Wherever we go, God is at work. And uh, that becomes the powerful thing. Sometimes we have to be a little bit detective when we look for what God is at work. If we spend a lot of time reading the newspapers and re watching media, what do we end up finding? Oh, this place is awful. That's when we need to be detectives for what God is doing. And we look for it and we search it out. And then we begin to see God moving in powerful ways. And that is powerful and wonderful. We begin to look and see what God is doing. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 86. Great is your love. And uh, we're going to be responsibly this morning. Among the gods, there is none like you. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations do the pain, the They will bring glory to his name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, Lord, and I will rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great 
is your love toward me. For great is your love toward me. For great is your love towards us. Great is your love, O God. Great is your love towards us. We echo what the psalmist wrote. And we're so grateful to know that you are great. We're grateful to know that you work in our lives. We're grateful to know that you are powerfully at work in many places around our community, around our world. And sometimes we have to look. Sometimes we have to see what you are doing. Become detectives. Thank you that we can see you, that we can watch you work, that we can know you are present and active in this world. Thank you, God, for that. For our time this morning, for our worship together, may you join us, may you join us together, may we join you in our time of celebration today. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Shine, Jesus, shine. Sherry, man, would you Please stand with us. Please stand with us.
we come before God in confession this morning, hear, from, hear what David says in Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. We need to come before God as people needing his mercy. As a community and as individuals, we have stepped away from his presence and from his direction. And as we come before God, let us remember that he is gracious. Let us pray silently first and then together. Let's pray together. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways. Forgive us, we pray, most spiritual Father, and free us from our sin. Renew us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Let's remember together the great promise from Psalm 51. Let's say it together. Create me a pure heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Amen. Jerry, band, would you lead us in our next song? Take my life and let it. Please stand with us.
Our Bible reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 10, verse 25 to verse 37. Luke chapter 10, verses 35, or 25 to verse 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he fell into the hands of robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged, bandaged his wounds, pouring oil on oil and wine. Then he took the man on his own donkey. He took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. May God bless this good word to our hearts. I think we often have simple questions, don't we? Or maybe the question should be, is there any such thing as an easy question or a simple question? Our, uh, our, little, our little grandson's not yet to the point where he's talking. He gets a couple words out here and there, Levi does. But I know before long, there's going to be one question that's going to dominate his vocabulary. Anybody have any idea what that might be? Albuquerque. Pardon? Albuquerque. It's not Albuquerque. <laughs> Why not? Why? 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 And we think that's a simple question. Oh, but is it a simple question? Not really, not really. No, it's not Albuquerque, Trevor. Gee whiz. You didn't try that hard last night trying to get him to say it. Nietzsche, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, was a critic of, of, of Christian faith. He was a critic of, of absolute thought. And he was a critic of, uh, particularly, of, of Christianity. But he also had a quote that I think Jesus would have agreed with. Hear me out on this one. He says this, he who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. He who has a why to live for can bear almost any how. And that, the, the thought that Nietzsche had there, Jesus was echoing when he spent time talking to this particular expert in the law, this lawyer that he was speaking with here in this passage. Now we've spent uh, the last five or six weeks looking at the nub of what does it mean to love God and to love people. We've looked at the Luke passage, we're looking at Luke today, we've looked at the Mark passage, we've touched a little bit on the Matthew passage. We've talked at the, at the Old Testament uh, passages of Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 19, where that, these passages come from, where they have their, origin, their origination. Um, but we need to look here at this particular passage, because here is the only passage where Jesus takes that little question, takes a simple question, and he explores it, and he expands it, and he, and he builds it up, not only to talk with that leader, or that teacher of the law, but to talk to you and I. Because the reality is we need to understand who our neighbor is, just as much as that law giver needed to do so. So there's a series of four questions that are being asked here. A series of four questions, and each one has a different, in, different take. And the three of them, before we get to the, the, the actual parable, and then one at the end of the parable. 
And I love the way Jesus always ends up. He never ties everything neatly in a bow, does he? He leaves you thinking. He leaves you contemplating. He leaves you with a, a sense of, okay, what do I do with this now? Because Jesus wants us to continue to reflect on what he has spoken, even as we move off into our day. He wants us to continue to reflect on it. So the first question, the teacher of the law says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So we look at this particular question, and more than that, we look at the, the man behind the question, the man who's asking that question. It was posed by this expert in the law. He was a lawyer or a scribe. Now, not a lawyer as we would understand a lawyer, but a lawyer who looked into the in-depth and you know, to the depths of what was taking place in the Old Testament law, particularly the Torah, and he would try to interpret that into application for the present day, or his present day, which was, which was Jesus' day. So this man was not a court lawyer. He didn't go into a courtroom and defend, you know, before a judge and a, and, and a trial, that sort of thing. That was not the kind of lawyer he was, but he was an expert in the law. He was also, he would have been called a scribe as well. He was a very practical man. He was practical in that he wanted to have a good question answered because the reality is, is that we want to see those questions. These are, this is a question that we are faced with, with regularly. What must I do to be saved? What must I do so that I can enter into the presence of God when my last breaths are taken here? What must I do to get there? Now it comes out in different ways and conversations in our, our culture, but it is there. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That was the first of these four questions. And he was, it showed that he was a practical man. He knew where he wanted to go. He knew that he wanted to get into the presence of into eternal life, but he did not know how to go about that. But more than that, to reflect on what Nietzsche said, is he missed the why. The idea of inheriting meant that somehow he was, it was obliged that he was going to get there. If this happened, this happened, this happened, then I was going to automatically get into eternal life. I'm going to inherit eternal life. It's mine, somehow. The question, though, is actually plain. It's plain. How is the precious, and how, and that is the precious understanding of eternal life. He wants to understand it. It's like a recipe. If I put this together, this together, this together, then I'm going to have it, and I'm going to be assured of it. But it's also the idea of inheriting. He's looking back on his history, on his heritage, that somehow, because he's been there, he's done the stuff, because he's lived a life that was good, according to the Torah, that means he must going to inherit it somewhere. There have been people who have questioned whether this particular teacher or this particular lawyer was um, trying to challenge Jesus or trying to take him down. There's no sense of that in the text. It's not a sense that he was trying to, trying to sort of bash Jesus. It was a sense that he really wanted to know. He really wanted to understand what Jesus' thoughts were about eternal life. And as a lawyer, as a tactician, he was focusing on these different tactics of salvation. But Jesus wanted to focus on something that he wasn't ready to deal with. He wanted to focus on his heart. He wanted to look internally at what he was dealing with. What, what was the why behind the how? Because that, when you, like Michi says, when you figure out the why, the how comes along. You can endure a lot of hows. So this, the same question was posed by us today. How do I get to heaven? How shall I be saved? Well, I don't want to go to hell, so what do I do? By people that are practical minded I want to understand what I need to do to get there. But Jesus wants us to be reminded in 2021 that the why is far more important than the how. When the why is taking place, the how will fall into line. And that's what he wants us to focus. So we looked at the first question. Jesus, or the first question that we see here, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The second question is posed by Jesus. It's actually a two-part question. And the two-part question is called, it's called a Socratic answer, which means it uses a question to answer a question. And he uses two questions to answer a question. And he looked at the man, he knew the kind of a person he was, he knew his analytical thinking, the kind of way that he would put things together. And so he asks him right straight, straight up, what is written in the law? And then the second part is interpretive. 
How do you see it? How do you read it? So Jesus answers this question with a question. He looks first to content. What does the law say? And then he looks to the more interesting one is how do you interpret that law? That was his specialty. As a lawyer, that was his specialty. Taking the words that God had written in the, in the Torah and interpreting that for the world in which he was living. What does God say about, and he was talking about it. So by referring to the law, Jesus, Jesus is directing the man to something that he trusted. This man is an interpreter of the law. As a, as a lawyer, he knew the Torah, he knew it inside and out, and he trusted it. So he was bringing it back to something both Jesus and the lawyer trusted and understood together. He says, what does it say in the law? What does it say here? And that's where he goes back to the Old Testament, back to Deuteronomy, and then to Leviticus. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We looked at that a number of weeks ago. That is the Shema. That, is the, that was the bedrock of every Jewish belief. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That was the foundation upon which everything else was built upon. That's what, that was so significant for them together to get this. So he uses this orthodox answer, and he, he goes back, and he knows that Jesus is going to be with him on this. He knows it. He understands it. He says, I know he's going to be with me on this. So love God and love people. It's a scripturally sound answer. And it's one that, but it's one that's only one-sided. And we get a little glimpse into the man here with that answer. We get a glimpse into what he, what the kind of a person he was in this particular answer. He answers focused on what he believed. That salvation is belief, but far more than that, and this is where you missed it. Salvation is action. And that's where we get an idea here that this guy was only concerned about the belief, about loving God and loving people. And that's and the unfortunate part is that often as we walk through our days and our lives, we can have good orthodox belief and terrible practice. We can say we're to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we can say we're to love people with all uh, love people as we love ourselves, and then we fall down when we get to the grocery store and we're three people deep and there's and we're tired and it's not been a long day and we want to get home and we snap at the, the person behind the counter because they have to wash the belt down one more time. Have you ever seen that yet in the last 18 months? I have. I even felt it. But that's where the practice, the, the, the reality of loving your neighbor as yourself has its outworking. When your neighbor puts his grass clippings on your driveway, love your neighbor as yourself. When you're, being, when you're passing, when you're going down the road and somebody cuts you off, love your neighbor as yourself. See, this man was so focused on the belief that he had missed the practice, the aspects that Jesus wanted to focus on. He wanted to know what he would do to inherit eternal life. Jesus says, it's not about what you do. It's not about what you believe. It's about how you act, how that flows out. Because he had the belief. He missed the rest. He missed the rest that was there. He was an educated man, and he realized that he could not possibly keep that law. That's the, that was always the, the conundrum with the Jewish Old Testament law, is that any one of them knew that they could not keep it. The Ten Commandments were an impossibility to keep. That was the reality. So then he says, how can I know? How can I be sure? All right, so we've seen the first question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the second question is just as equally as important. What is written in the law? That Socratic question, when well, Jesus answers a question with two questions. Then we come to the third question. And the third question is the very interesting aspect of it that leads into the, the aspect of the parable that we all know so well. The third question is, uh, the third question is, is very simple. 
Very simple. Who is my neighbor? You see, this question is a limiting question. And as a, as a, as a lawyer, somebody who, whose whole sole job is to interpret the Torah for the interaction with people, this meant a big thing. This was important to him. For it, but it was a limiting question in, t- in terms of, it was saying, it, it was not so much who is my neighbor as if broadening and making it larger, but who is my neighbor as if to limit it and make it smaller and more, and more compact. For, us, for the Greek, uh, neighbor meant someone who is near. So here in this particular room, we're all neighbors because we're near, but somebody a block that way may not be my neighbor because they are not near. And uh, particularly with uh, the ideas of COVID these days with masks and social distancing, we need to reevaluate near. We need to sort of rethink what it means to be near because near is not somebody who's right next to you. For us during COVID, near is uh, three feet apart or six feet apart. But not only for the the Greeks it meant somebody is near, but for the Hebrew, it meant somebody uh, who you have an association with. So therefore, a neighbor could be your physical next door neighbor, as in your home above you or or beside you or below you. That could be your neighbor because you have an association with them. But it also could be your coworkers because your coworkers have an association with you. They share a cubicle or they share an office or they share a skill set with you, so they are your neighbors. Your neighbors could also be your grocery store clerk when you go in because you have an association with them. It is brief and and it is is one-sided, but it is still an association. For a moment, for the Jew, that person is my neighbor. My neighbor is also my family, because my family I have an association with, including my extended family I have an association with. So what the the teacher here is trying to do, what the, the lawyer is trying to do, is narrow that down. Bring it down to a point where he can say, oh, okay, now I get it. But more importantly, he's trying to narrow that down so that he can say, oh, now I know who I can exclude from being a neighbor. Who I can set aside from being a neighbor. Somebody who is not my neighbor. So then that means something like the Samaritans. And that'll be important in a moment. The Romans, Greeks, and others who are not Jewish, others that don't connect. I don't have to worry about them because they're not my neighbor. I'm okay. I can get away from it. How often do we do that today in our culture? How often in our lives do we do that? Yes, our neighbor is the person that we share a fence with, either behind or beside, or, or, or uh, perhaps uh, the next door neighbor above. Yeah, we go, okay, that's my neighbor. We also think about the neighbor as being the person that uh, we connect with at work. But we do want to try to limit it. Well, that person is not my neighbor because I don't know them. I only see them on the street. I only maybe walk by them at the grocery store, so they're not my neighbor. I don't have to love them. Do you see the limiting aspect here that was going on? But Jesus wants to take this for a moment, and he wants to correct false understandings that this lawyer had about who is my neighbor. He wants to, he wants to correct false thinking. If you remember, the idea of this, the, the, uh, of this whole aspect of loving your neighbor was how do I love God first and then love my neighbor? And so when he asks the question, he's limiting it. Remember, it's an intellectual aspect for him. It's, it's, it's a faith aspect for him, but not a practical action aspect. Jesus wants to move it from just strictly a, an emotional or a, a mental issue down to a heart issue. That's what he wants to do. He wants to Break those boundaries. Broaden the perspective, not limit it. So he comes up with the parable, and he tells the story. Now, the, the parable was, uh, of this, was, t- was the telling of the story of a man traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now, Jerusalem to Jericho is about 17 miles. It's a very circu- circuitous route. It goes back and forth. There's lots of crags. There's lots of gullies. There's lots of uh, things that people can hide in. And those who are morally compromised, they're the ones that are going to find places in there to jump out and to steal somebody's, to, to beat somebody and steal them and take their stuff. And that's exactly what happens in this parable. The man was traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem and on his way down, he was beaten up by robbers and left half dead. He was taken advantage of. 
he was in a sorry state of mind. And he spent, Jesus here spends no time describing the priest. Um, oh, sorry, but let's take a step backwards there. There are four characters that appear in this particular parable. Character number one is the person that is injured. The, the, the one who, who had, was beaten up and left for half dead. The second character is the priest. And he, Jesus spends no time with either the priest or the next character, the Levite, going into any details other than to describe them as a priest and a Levite. And so he describes the Levite uh, and tells only that he showed no love or compassion at all for the man. As he walked up to him, he saw him laying on the ground, and instead of doing something, at least instead of having his heart say, ah, he walks around him, keeping as great distance as he can from the man lying there. He doesn't want to be associated with it. There's no compassion. There's no love for the man lying on the ground. Then the third person that we see in this is the Levite. And the Levite comes by as well. And in this parable, he does exactly what the priest, the priest does. He goes by without showing any compassion. Two of the religious leaders of the time, two who were supposed to reflect the character and the love of God for people, both showed no compassion for that man who was injured at all. Theirs was very limiting. That's not my neighbor. I have no association with him. I have no connection to him. I don't even know what his nationality is. I'm not dealing with it. And around they went. The third, the fourth person that we see in this particular uh, parable is the Samaritan. The one who is least likely to have compassion. The one who is least likely to see that man, whether that man was Jew or, or Gentile, it didn't matter. Least likely to see that man and go, hey, wait a minute. I gotta help. He was the least likely to do that. We don't know whether that man was a Jew or a Gentile. We don't know whether he was uh, whether he was religious or not. We don't know the color of his skin. And for that matter, it did not matter to the Samaritan. He stopped. He saw the man laying there, and he said, "I've got to help. Regardless, I've got to do something." It touched his heart. He didn't see the color of the man's skin. He didn't see the religious. Symbols that he might have worn. He didn't see the language or hear the language that he spoke. He saw only the need that was there. And he was moved by that need. He was moved by the need that was there, not by some emotional response, but his outpouring of support and affirmation of the need. It was his actions that made the difference. He didn't sit back and go, oh, and walk on. He took action. In our culture of, of uh, social media, there's many times that people will get on Facebook or Instagram and they will type away and they will talk about feeling sorry for somebody, but that never results in action. The downfall of social media, while it can be a good platform, the downfall of social media is that it d detaches action from words. Words are plenty, but actions are few. And in this case, there was few words from the Samaritan, but plenty of action. He got in and got dirty. He was moved by the need. So he goes beyond and above the minimum required. He dresses the wounds, pouring oil and wine. He takes the man, puts him on his own, on his own animal. He walks, he walks him to the nearest inn. He takes the time to make sure that he's all taken care of, and then he pays the innkeeper extra money to make sure that he's looked after until he's well enough. And he promises that he will return and he will settle up if there's any more debts that are, are owed. He went above and beyond. He did not have to do this. As a Samaritan, he was part Jew and part Gentile. The Jews looked down on them as dogs, less than, than really... Uh, Less than, than, than human almost. But he acted more human than either of those two characters that walked before. He acted more like Christ than either of the two, either of the Jew or either of the Levite or the priest. He walked the walk. The Samaritan saw his neighbor as anyone who was in need. This leads us to the fourth question. And the last question that's a part of this particular 
story. The fourth question is simple. Which of these do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? Who was the neighbor? Who was the neighbor? For you and I, we might go, hey, that's simple. It was the Samaritan. He had compassion. He was the neighbor. He didn't know him, didn't have any connection. He was the neighbor. He was drawing the line. And it's true. However, the last question isn't so simple. Rather, it is incredibly deep and it's filled with nuances. You see, the last question that was asked here exposes some issues that are going on with the lawyer's heart. But also, it does the same thing to you and I today. The first thing it exposes here is the strong, strong contrast by those who knew the law and those who actually followed the law and obeyed it and did it. It means that those who have the information stored up here, those who know the in outs of the law, and those who actually saw the action were often two different things. And it exposed that difference. It exposes the difference today in, in our Christianity, doesn't it? We can, we can uh, give mouth service and lip service to knowing God, to celebrating Him, to, being a, to, to having Him as our Savior, to following Jesus as our Lord. But sometimes we don't do the things that we ought to do. The second thing it exposes is the lawyer's personal hardness of He was only concerned about his intellectual assent to the, to the faith and how that worked out. He had forgot about what it meant to be compassionate. His heart was hard. Of course he had to say it was, the, it was the Samaritan. He didn't use the name. But he had to say that because that was what Jesus was expecting. But it revealed in his heart that there was no other option and I'm sure as he choked back those words, it was like, mm. it was the one who showed compassion because it reflected the hardness of his heart. The third, different, the third thing it exposes, the lawyer's hate for the Samaritans, the lawyer's intolerance, the lawyer's bigotry for those who are different. The Samaritans were seen as dogs, less than human. And as such, they didn't deserve respond, or didn't deserve anything. Yet here in this case, he couldn't even use the word Samaritan. He referred to him as the one who had compassion. As, a, as if somehow, Samaritans weren't com- capable of compassion. And how often today do we see that sort of thing comes up in our lives? We won't even refer to somebody by their name or their race or their religion because somehow those people, those people don't have that. And then when we see it, we go, oh, how do we deal with this? That was the problem. That was how this question dug deeply into the Samaritan, into the lawyer's heart and reminded him that he needed to show compassion. He needed to show compassion. Now the last question demands action. And this is where Jesus, where the message of the parable hits the road. It's where the rubber meets the road. He says, go and do likewise. Now if you were that lawyer, probably they said, well, do what a Samaritan does. Have compassion on somebody you don't know? Broke to break the barrier of what it means to be a neighbor? That seemed to be beyond it. You see, we are to show compassion and love to those we encounter in our everyday activities. It doesn't matter whether they are our physical neighbors or not. It doesn't matter when we touch base with them, when we connect up with them, whether it's physically, whether it's virtually, whether it's online, we need to show compassion. Go and do likewise, Jesus says. You see, we are to love others. We are to, regardless of their race, their religion, the criterion is need. When the Samaritan saw, it was the need that drew him, not the race, the creed, the religion, or ideologies. But often, way too often in our culture today, particularly in this mid-pandemic or waning pandemic, do we see this happening? 
We see that in our culture, we see that in our politics, we see that in our ideologies. All of a sudden, we're more concerned about what somebody believes or thinks or acts rather than and what the color of their skin is, rather than having compassion. Rather than having compassion. We are to love others. We are to give generously. We are to come, you know, deal with people with, with abs- absolute generosity. But oftentimes, we're more concerned about what they look like, what color, of their, what color of their skin is, what their, their uh, ideology happens to be, whether they're a liberal or a conservative, a Democrat or a Republican. Jesus says we need to stop that. Love doesn't see those things. Love goes beyond. There's also an, an impossible obligation for that lawyer, and that is well for us. He cannot keep the law because he realizes that to keep the law is an impossibility. It's an impossibility for him because of our human condition, because of our fallenness, because of the state of our heart. We can't keep that law. And when that lawyer went through and interpreted those 10 words, the 10 commandments, and then all of the other rules and regulations that surrounded it, he recognized that his own inability would stare back in his face. That's why he had to keep it up here in his mind and not down in his actions. And that same thing is reflected to us when we read the Ten Commandments, when we even look at what Jesus says here, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, we realize we fall short. And that becomes a problem. That becomes a problem. So the lesson of the parable of the Good good, uh, Samaritan is really threefold, and I want to finish off with this. First, we are to set aside our prejudice and show love and compassion for others. We're to set it aside. We're to look beyond it. Simple as that. It's never to be, it's never to be something that blocks. The second thing is our neighbor is anyone we encounter. Anyone we encounter, no matter where they are. We are all creatures of the Creator. We're all to, we're to love all of mankind, no matter who they are. We're to love them whether they're black, whether they're orange. I don't think we actually have orange people. Whether they're blue. We are to love them regardless of their skin color. We're to love them regardless of their religion. We're to love them regardless of their creeds. We're to love them regardless of their gender or their gender descriptions or their ideologies or their political backgrounds. We are to love them. Period. We're to love them as Jesus has taught us to love them. And probably the most important thing that this brings to us is this. When we have compassion on others, we recognize our need. You see, it was Jesus' compassion for you and me as believers in Jesus. It was his compassion in the midst of our sin, in the midst of the the darkness, in the midst of the things that cut us off from him, that sent him to the cross to die for us. You see, in a way, Jesus is the good Samaritan. As he comes along, he sees sees us dying, half half dead, being beaten up and stolen by Satan. And he goes, I'm going to have compassion. But instead of just giving, just pouring wine and, and oil and paying the bills, he gives his life for you and for me. He gives his life. And when Jesus asked that lawyer, go and do likewise, he asks the same thing for us. Go and do likewise. As you have received the grace of Jesus Christ, go and show that grace of Jesus Christ to everyone, everywhere. All the time. Four questions. Four questions that led that man to a place where he had to make a choice, where he had to make a choice to either follow or not. What's your choice today? Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful to you for all the work you do in us. Thank you for salvation given to us freely through your blood, Jesus. Thank you 
that you saw us in our need and you gave us what we needed. You covered us with your blood. You restored us through your broken body. Jesus, we have that, not because of what we have done, not because of our goodness, but because of your love and compassion. Thank you. Father, may we show that compassion to this world. May we demonstrate to this world all the love and compassion that you demonstrated to us. May we go and do likewise. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have noticed that uh, things changed partway through this, the message. And it did so because the, the video stopped recording. And as a result of that, we lost the last part of the service. So we want, I want to, uh, we're going to let you go at this point, And we're going to say thank you so much for being a part of our service today. And we wish you all of God's blessings in the week to come.